Good evening, everybody. My name is Paul Pru. I'm a land use lawyer. Uh, here to talk to you a little bit about the legal aspects of uh, a site assemblage, uh, essentially. Um, this is, uh, by way of giving you a bit of a background, uh, I'm going to blow through it pretty quickly. I, I assume that everybody has a passing familiarity with some of the topics. Uh, ever since 1978, when the City Planning Commission uh, passed an amendment to the zoning resolution, and the City Council adopted the amendment, the Department of Buildings issued a guidance that you can find online. These four documents are necessary to merge a zoning lot with another zoning lot. And so the reason why you do that is if you have a site like this, but you'd like to build more on that site than what is allowed by law, what you do is you add another lot, right? And now each of the lots retain their tax lot identity, but the zoning lot is everything you see here in pink. So all the rights generated there go towards the existing building, which remains, and the new building over here. And that's done by merging the zoning lots together. And for a big site, what you can do is you can take not just the development site and the site next to it, but you can daisy chain the lots. Anything with 10 contiguous square feet can be added until eventually you have a site like this. And the whole point is to take the extra air rights you haven't used over here and put them on top over here. And if you do enough of that, you can get a big tall building. Okay, this is the uh, 845 UM Plaza that our president uh, was involved with years ago. And that was the, that's the zoning lot that that sits on. This is where the building is here in a little rectangle. This is the entire zoning lot. It was done very quietly. They pulled permits, everybody was very surprised. It was one of those things where everybody was like, all right, now we see how it works. So um, that's de rigueur today, OK? The agreements between uh, the different lot owners are called zoning lot development agreements. And they involve the transfer of floor area development rights. That's what we talked about just a moment ago with the square footage. You will uh, also see construction license language in there uh, for roof protection and uh, things like that so that uh, if there's any damage to the transferring parcels, so there's a, an established uh, playing field. You'll do parking easements, where one site will provide parking for another. Egress easements, where you have access to the existing buildings through other buildings. Uh, open space allocation for what are called height factor buildings uh, can be uh, governed by zoning lot development agreements. And then um, you've got error parcels, which I, I think are kind of interesting and, and worth a quick uh, examination. We'll get into that. We'll also talk about light and air easements and then cantilevers and bridging, which is the, uh, the sort of the reason why we're here today. So air parcels are a relatively new item. Um, you know, the, the thing about all of this, right, as Mark Twain says, uh, you know, buy land, because they're not making anymore, right? And ever since 78, you've been getting more and more creative with what you can do with Zeldas and transferring air rights and getting more square footage out of the site. Well, air parcels are one of the latest things, right? So you have a block and lot down here, which is a zoning lot. And what you can do is you can subdivide that zoning lot on the, on the, on the vertical. So you create in, uh, a, a fee above the plane. Uh, somewhere above the level of the building, you establish a fee. And you subdivide the tax lot into a 9,000 series tax lot. So you see here, lot 23 here. The Department of Finance will establish lot 9,023 up top. <laughs> And then just like when you're transferring air rights from down the block, you can transfer the air rights up, sell the building, and preserve ownership in the air parcel. And then that, you assign a separate deed to that to your neighbor at some point in time in the future. Which is kind of like an innovative, fun thing, right? <laughs> so that's just a little tangent on uh, the topic today. Um, air parcels. This is a point. Following up on the air parcels, this is the procedure uh, in which you uh, establish the air parcels. But I don't think we really need to get into the details of it. The long and the short of it is you have to file a bunch of paperwork at finance. You have to record a bunch of property against the original lot to establish a meets and bounds for the air parcel. You terminate that stuff once you establish the air parcel. You transfer the air rights up into the air parcel. And then you record a deed of transferring the ownership of the air parcel to a, a third party. Exciting stuff. Light and air easements. This is another thing we put in Zeldas, OK? Light and air easements uh, are designed to give a tall building the right to look out and get legal light and air from an adjacent parcel. And so the idea is, um, pursuant to the multiple dwelling law of the state of New York, 
uh, legal windows must receive at least 30 feet of light and air for a residential building. And you can have that on your own lot, uh, from your backyard, you can get that from a street, and you can get that from a lawful court or a setback. That's what the law says. The way that the definition of lot is defined relative to light and air, it's got to be the same zoning lot. So again, when you merge the zoning lot, you can use your neighbor's light and air to provide lot line windows or other uh, legal light and air for the new building. However, and this is where yeah, this is where the details get kind of interesting. With respect to fire safety requirements for opening protectors, the building code measures fire separation distances to the tax lot line. So we're going to distinguish in this talk today about light and air, which you can get from a zoning lot, and fire separation, which often refers to the tax lot line, except for in special circumstances. And this is all pursuant to a bulletin by the Department of Buildings. If you'd like further information on this, it's bulletin um, 10 in 1987. Actually, it's not. It's bulletin 13 of 15. Mm -hmm. 10 of 1987 was the uh, original citation. Something got mixed up there. Um, so here's an example of that, right? You have these windows on a lot line. They're getting their light and air here from the street, maybe. But on the side lot line, you have merged this tax lot, this tax lot, this tax lot into a single zoning lot. And the light and air is being provided from this lawful court or yard above these buildings. So these windows can look out of there. However, because they're on the lot line, they can only have a 10% opening per story. So the facade, if a, if a single story has a facade of 100%, only 10% of that story can have actual openings in it. That's to uh, provide fire protection. In the case one of these buildings catches on fire, the flames don't leap into the other building and cause uh, a problem there. Okay, cantilever easements are the next thing we do, where we're building actually over the adjacent buildings. You establish a light and air easement at a horizontal plane, kind of like where we talk about an air parcel. And above that horizontal plane, the building below will not build. They agree not to build. And therefore, you are guaranteed light and air above it. The Department of Buildings will recognize that and uh, give you an approval for a legal window in that situation. A cantilever easement simply adds an encroachment right onto and over that horizontal plane. And so typically you have a, a a plane that's established at some sort of level above uh, an elevation, a New York datum, or um, Sandy Hook is often referred to. Uh, for some reason, there's some sort of marker there uh, that the Army Corps of Engineers has established. And then there's uh, the common boundary in between the buildings. So it's uh, maybe you have a cantilever right for 10 feet over from the shared lot line, 12 feet, 90 feet, uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about the extent to which that becomes practical from a structural engineering point, from an architectural engineering point of view, from a developer's point of view. So that's an introduction to the legal concepts that we're going to be discussing today. And we're going to uh, explore that. Here's an example of a famous cantilever. This is the uh, Porter House building in the meatpacking districts. One of the first that uh, many people notice because it has two different colors for the two separate uh, parts of the building. But it's, it's just a simple uh, short cantilever over the adjacent uh, low-rise building. We're going to talk about this on steroids, uh, on a going forward basis. This is an example of bridging, just so that we know what we're talking about. When you're bridging, you have two points of the building that go up and they connect up top. So they're similar principles to a cantilever, but uh, you're essentially building over an open space. So now that we have a vocabulary straight, let's get into some case studies and talk a little bit about one Madison. Okay, great. So I, we have lots of great buildings to show. And we'll talk to a few of them in the interest of time with this panel. But uh, one Madison uh, has been featured here at the Skyscraper Museum. Uh, Sylvia Firm and our firm might work together on this project. It's one of the first um, slender, I think it was the most slender building at the time. It was a 12 to 1 slenderness ratio. And since that time, I think it's up to 23 to 1 on the project going to 57th Street. But this at the time was groundbreaking. So, you know, in, in New York, there's only so many sites, only, only so much land. So in our, you know, toolbox of, uh, of tricks, you know, the cantilever becomes an important uh, tool to try to maximize what a, cell, a site potential can achieve. So there was, a, there was many lots around this site that had development rights that were unused, and we I mean, the cantilever in this case actually came out of constructability. So the three big reasons why you would cantilever, one of the biggest one is really efficiency on the floor plate. If you have a small site, 
you have a small floor plate. If you can cantilever, that floor plate's a, lot, a little bit larger, and the efficiency goes up. And what does that mean? We only have so much FAR, so if I have a small floor plate, I have a taller building, and in the residential market, which most of these buildings are you know, generated by a residential type project, um, as we get uh, every floor added to the building, there's a portion of the building you can't sell. <laughs> the elevator is a common stairs, the common hallway between the apartments can't be sold. So every time we go up, we have only so much sellable area on that floor plate. The smaller the floor plate, you know, less sellable for the core. That core takes up a certain amount of square footage, just between five, eight hundred square feet per floor. So every time I add a floor, I basically lose 800, 500 square feet of sellable area. So there's a delicate balance here because height is perceived as you know, the higher you go, the more value it creates, but you are losing sellable. So there's a balance that has to be played here. So when you cantilever, you can make a slightly bigger floor plate. You get up, the, the efficiency per floor goes up, so the sellable and, and your, how much you have to sell goes up. So efficiency is a key factor. Uh, views are a key factor, and constructability becomes a key factor. And one in Madison, one of the biggest factors that came into the site was one of the adjacent parcels that we were getting our, uh, our development rights from, which was, uh, a McDonald's site was right next door to us, and they had a very long-term lease. So we had to plan a way of how do we build our building, and you know, ahead of when this lease would expire. So when the lease would expire, we then could, you know, fill in that portion of the bottom of the building and, and, and continue going up. So the cantilever was generated just over the fact that we we're going to cantilever over that one site, and our footprint became uh, the portion that we could, you know, start construction on sooner. And then the design of this. You know, very iconic building, I think, now on the skyline was to take that cantilever and start to remove these, you know, areas every every four to five floors to create outdoor space and also kind of give this kind of stack box effect on the building. <laughs> but the one of the interesting factors here, uh, besides the efficiency, was the structural design to make this happen. So this is uh, this way. So here's just a quick, you know, analysis of the site. It was a through lot site. Those are the parcels involved, um, and then the two of where we can build our new building and what that generated and then you can kind of see the two adjacent parcels that we took their development rights and what it did to the overall tower height um, and then kind of end up with our final form. But I think, you know, working with Sylvia, that a lot of structural implications were very, you know, a key factor in how this building would lay out. So, you know, traditionally you would see a structure, and I think you see this at, at 432, where you'll have the structure around the perimeter create this kind of uh, structural frame, but we had we had preserved views on all four sides of the building, so we wanted to get the structure off the window. We wanted as much glass as possible. So working with Sylvia's group, we came up with this cruciform structural shape to get the mass that we needed for the shear capacity of the building and keep the column uh, sizes down. So Sylvia, I just want to talk to this a little bit and how we got here. Well, um, definitely we like to talk about structure. <laughs> One of the main issues uh, that we have an object that uh, in this case it's very slender and uh, what means slenderness? Uh, the dynamic factors and the sensitivity of the occupants to the movement of the building becomes a major factor as opposed to a building that is not slender, that has a large base, where the movement of the building, of every building is moving, are not sensitive to the uh, occupants because of the, what we call it, the building acceleration is the one that uh, gives you the feeling of movement. So that was our primary factor uh, in one medicine uh, at the time. Uh, however, the second factor was the structure to be efficient in a way to leave space, sufficient space for the occupants. Because uh, if you are going to have uh, lots of columns and walls and beams, and uh, there is no place to play to put a, a bed or a table. So. As you can see here, we have just, we have another drawing that shows a little bit better, but we have some walls that are usually devising 
demising walls between the apartments. And uh, we have another slide with the four mm -hmm. and the have perpendicular that. one. That, that will show a little bit better uh, how the structure is being utilized. Now, the, the cantilevers, they are within the rhythm of the construction. They did not delay the construction, and um, that's the main factor as far as the cost is concerned. Uh, by the end of the day, we have a beautiful product, and uh, I read in the newspaper that this guy, uh, Murdoch, was looking for an apartment for three months, and after three months, he bought three duplexes in this building. So that means that it's a good product and uh, <laughs> the architect, they, uh, <laughs> they deserve the money that they come <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so this was actually, uh, this, this, the larger floor plate here was actually 3,500 square feet. And without the cantilever, it would be much smaller than that, which a residential condominium, you know, it's still kind of small. Now, John, you can talk. We're working with uh, Rockefeller right now on a, on a building in Nomad where we're cantilevering over the adjacent site. And we're running into two issues that kind of played a key factor in how far we cantilevered and how tall we went with the building because a few things came into play on, on our site that we're working on together. And I don't have that image because it's kind of not hit the market yet. So we were sensitive not to kind of show what the early images of the building look like. But we got to an interesting height in terms of once we looked at cantilevers and, and, a, and a, a cantilever that was a little bit not aggressive. We ended up with a 10 foot cantilever. We can, you know, so we can talk to some of the limitations of cantilever. That's a piece of cake. Piece of cake. <laughs> but we were able, we got to a height that kind of triggered an interesting thing. We were about 600 feet tall and we were about probably a little bit over 600 feet. And all other kind of construction costs that are coming into play with additional uh, fire reserve tanks that had to be introduced in the project once we broke the 600 foot threshold. So in that case, we actually kind of balanced the efficiency of the cantilever on hitting that kind of magic height and worked our section around that. And then you can talk to a little bit from there. So as Eugene has said, this is a balancing act of cost, schedule, what we're trying to achieve in terms of sellable area, very much driven by structure. Uh, the project in question is actually a, a mid-block, relatively small site. It is a Zelda. Uh, so zoning lot assemblage, um, we do have light and air easement, so a lot of things that we, we talked about in the, the zoning piece contribute to making this a very tall building, but coming out of a small site with the required setbacks, it is very, very slender. So the cantilever enabled us to increase the floor area by about, the sellable floor area by about 3%, um, which is very significant in this market. And finding that balance, that, and that is, as you said, what drove the dimension on the cantilever was the balance of do we go taller, do we make the cantilever a little bit bigger, um, and then what does this all mean from a constructability perspective and a cost perspective. Uh, Lendlease is working with us, I don't know if there's anybody in the room from Lendlease, but uh, the constructability is, yes, more complex, but this is not as unique as it was 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and as Sylvian said, 10 feet is a piece of cake comparatively. And we're gonna talk about some that are a little bit larger. But it, we were able to find, I think, the sweet spot of structural efficiency, constructability, not paying a, an enormously restrictive um, cost, for what ends up being a much more sellable building because we were able to expand, but it's 3% overall, but on the upper floors, is, which are the most valuable floors, um, where we were able to increase the floor plates in the most significant way. John, how did you determine what was a reasonable value to pay for the right to cantilever over your neighbor's property? It's a bit of an algorithm. So there, there's, a give and take um, on the cost of the work, the schedule implication, how that then translates into sellable. Uh, 
the site assemblage, and including the Zelda, was all in place. We originally were not doing a cantilever, uh, so that it was something I characterize as we discovered as we went through the process that there was an opportunity uh, to make this a much better building and therefore um, much more economically successful. Yeah, in the case of 20, their project on 29th Street, I mean, we did on the, uh, I guess it's on the uh, west side, facing side of the building where the building is cantilevering. Without the cantilever, we had the 30 foot. We needed for legal light and air, but when we cantilever, we didn't have the 30 foot. So we, we were able to have legal light and air towards the street and towards our yard, but we didn't happen to need the light and air. So they kind of bought it with the rights to do it, not knowing if how much they would use it. And using it actually, I think, wind up being very beneficial. So just by way of uh, a little bit of additional background, when you're uh, setting up a site like this, you buy the air rights from the adjacent property. You ask for the additional right to either take light and air from above their building or to the right to cantilever. And oftentimes, when you're selling those rights uh, to a developer, you know it's an additional x per square foot that you add on top of the uh, the conversation. Uh, and it's a negotiation back and forth. There's not a, an open market for these things. It's what you can agree to uh, between two parties to, to come to a conclusion on. Uh, and that also is part of the balancing right. in, in this whole <laughs> algorithm. Uh, what are we paying for these rights? Are we maximizing the use of these rights? Uh, and does it translate to enough increase in your sellable margin to underwrite the whole thing? Right. But, but they are not related to the cantilever per se. It's just the air rights that do not have to be a cantilever. Well, it, it relates somewhat though, because if you have the air rights and it's a fixed number, right? you're going to build a tall building, but if you can bring the efficiency down and build out, right, it's well, more that's, profitable. That's exactly mm -hmm. the point, because in many cases, you hear a conversation when you are talking about the cantilever, where now the question is, what's the penalty? In our book, this is not a penalty. That's a benefit. It's an improvement, because you have two cases. Either you use the error rights, I mean, assuming the error rights is a given constant, either you go taller or if you, mm -hmm. you spread horizontally. Now, usually these buildings are very small place, what we call it, like 4,000 square foot that mm -hmm. Eugene was talking about. Now, to build a, bed, a small plate of 4,000 square foot, it's very inefficient because you have a set up number of laborers that uh, it's in between the guy that uh, carries the flag and the one that brings the water. You need the, the same number of people if, uh, if it's a 4,000 square foot or it's a 6,000 square foot, let's say. It's definitely the same number of laborers. Let's say about 50 guys. 50 guys for a 4,000 square foot plate. The same 50 guys can build a 6,000 square foot plate. No, nobody in excess of exactly the same number. So now you are increasing the efficiency. The only difference like 33%. And the cost per square foot is going up. Now take it up. the cost per square foot is going down because you are using the same number of laborers and take, take in account that within the cost per square foot of construction, the labor is about 65% of the cost. 35% are materials, cranes, insurance, etc. 65% is, is labor. So by the end of the day, despite the fact that you pay a little bit more for the cantilever itself, you are going to save on the total number or the total cost of the project. The only difference with those 50 laborers, though, is you have to fire one of them and replace them with Sylvian because you need a better engineer. <laughs> <laughs> that comes. Uh, the same. The same principle applies when we're talking about building up with air rights, right? Uh, we have some costs with the foundation. We have some costs with an elevator. We've already paid an architect to design the building. Now we're just adding floors on top. 
it's already it's more profitable. And we do it with no extra cost. Same thing, can't deliver or not, our fee is the same. So <laughs> at some point, when you know, in, in the analysis, when does the depth what depth of the can leave us becoming a premium on construction costs? Because we know 10 feet, you've said in the past when we work together, 10, 12 feet is really a minimal cost on construction. But after but, what? Correct. But you didn't take into account that, as I said, I will, I will give you a number, though. The, the number that I believe that is the break even is about 30 feet. Mm -hmm. Up to 30 feet, in my book, in our book, we, on the overall cost of the project, you are going to save money because you have a larger plate. Mm -hmm. And having a larger plate to the same number of people, of laborers, eventually the cost is going down and it's not going up. So, now foundation is the same. Taking account, less elevators. You, rather than going 20 feet higher, now you go 20 feet less. So the elevator saving, the, all the pipes, all the plumbing, all the, everything around. And most importantly, it's a better efficient usage for the occupants. That's the most important one. Environmentally, rather than going to all these buildings, tall buildings, I cannot say that I hate, but uh, uh, it's nicer to have uh, something more solid. So let's move on to the next case study. Okay. One other thing I wanted to point out on, uh, on that we didn't touch upon. I mean, in the image Paul brought up with that, you know, the ten percent diagram. Cantilevers in New York are very complicated to get through the whole uh, the whole process, the whole design process, on because not only are there these horizontal separations that you have uh, for legal light and air. There are vertical separations for fire rate that have to be accounted for, which is a, actually the building code now requires a, a full engineering analysis, a burnout analysis of the building. That's where you burn down completely, your building will be standing. So the separation of off of that roof when you have the cantilever, how high that cantilever has to be, could be anywhere from 30 feet to 60 feet and greater. So, and you, these are not information you can get very quickly. The, the, the analysis takes a long time. They, they, they need to have all the existing conditions of that building next door correctly, you know, engineered and, and calculated in. And so that's one separation. So how, you know, how far are you going to be away from your neighbor and height? You know, it will affect how much you can use that efficiency. And then you know, those, that percentage of 10% means you know, there's not a lot of openings for a certain distance. There's an additional diagram that comes in this particular uh, TPTN, where they go into uh, a next step that if you're 60 feet away from anything else around you that is not your lot, you can take that 10% up to possibly 100% on the opening for legal light and air and not require fire rating. So these calculate into how you design the building because, you know, I can design a glass building with 10% openings, but that glass building has to be fire rated. It's a fire rating issue. Um, and that's extremely expensive. I'll end up designing a building that's probably much more solid with smaller you know, openings in it. I can meet this percentage and get the legal light and I need and not get into additional construction costs. But I'll have to design that in. And after a certain distance beyond the 60 foot rule, I can go you know, much more open, much more light in windows and, and, and meet the requirements. So this is why we characterize this as a, an algorithm. There are so many different inputs, so many variables. And there's a give and take, a push and pull across those. So it's a very iterative process that happens very quickly as you move through the schematic design phase. Yeah, so we'll just we'll quickly go through some other buildings. This is a building that we have done that we use the cantilever for all the same reasons. Uh, here's a site that was a, a through lot site that we merged with a, uh, a theater behind us. So we had separation between building issues that we had to deal with. We had. Uh, uh, we had a, a subway tunnel that went past the site, so that kind of influenced the shape of the tower. And here's a case where we actually, you know, to kind of, and here's the diagram that I kind of walk you through what goes on here. So here's the site up on the, on the top uh, right, I guess you're right, uh, your left, um, of, of the site itself. There's a, the little white square between us is the uh, historic uh, theater that was part of our lot. So our lot actually included that. And traditional zoning would allow us to kind of 
build a mess from side to side. We'd have yard requirements that come and play on a through lot that would have limited how close we can come to the street line. But you know, when you deal with through lots in New York City, there are other rules on, on yards that you can use. And the two other options are you can do a typical yard between the two buildings of 30 feet for residential, and a commercial is 20, between the center line of the, of the two lots. So a 200 foot lot in the middle of say 100 feet, within five feet of that 100 feet, you can do a 60 foot yard. But that creates two, two towers on a lot, which is not always your ideal situation. Maybe bridging comes in and maybe it works, or maybe you know, that's not an efficient building for you. Then you have another option where you can put the, the, that rear yard instead of between the back of your building, you can put it on the front of your building. You can do basically a front yard on both sides of the building of 30 feet to achieve the 60 feet and move all your mass to the center, creating one, one building tower. And then there was an option for side yards. It's the first time we actually use side yards. So if your lot well, is continuous, you can do two 30 foot side yards and still meet this yard requirement. In, in one case, you know, it kind of led to the, 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 the mass of this building going up taller in a more efficient kind of footprint closer to the street line where the better views down the avenue to the water were going to be. And then we kind of carved the corner off based on a constructability issue there with the tunnel and trying to avoid the, our column of structure hitting the tunnel. And then we further articulated the building and pulled it and cantilevered towards the view. So in this case, the upper floors of this building are, much, are progressively larger than the lower floors where, again, the value of these units would be. So we kept articulating a way and using the, this was a midtown zoning site, so we had a compensating recess calculation that's very complicated to kind of see how much we can pull to the street line if we pull certain portions back from the street line to create really the most valuable use of the limited FAR that you have. So here's a case where cantilever came in for every reason, you know, uh, on the front and back as well as on, on the, you know, some of the sides for structural reasons. And you can kind of see in, in this diagram here what those side yards led us to really great opportunities for creating open space on top of our building uh, for the residents to use. This is the, kind of uh, an axon of the lower floor, floor of the building. We have these two floors of amenities and these two side yard spaces on top of so the these, roofs. These are your side yards over here. Yes. And then where is the cantilever on the roof? So the floors are just progressively kind of cantilevering up towards the top, so they're just getting bigger. This is the smallest footprint at the bottom. And you'll kind of see towards the upper, it's hard to kind of tell in the axle how much further it can leave out with the balconies and as well as, you know, the floor area itself is kind of just progressively getting so This is not a cantilever that extends over another zoning or a tax lot line, but it's on your site and it shifts around in order to maximize. Yeah. This is a cantilever on our site, so we don't need to get the bigger footprint, you know, over someone else's site, but it did get, give us a bigger footprint on our own lot for really kind of the most valuable part of the building being the top of the building. And then a project on 59th Street that we currently have under construction had cantilevers for multiple reasons. We had a cantilever of our, uh, over the building to the, uh, to the right here, my right looking area, the south. South, the south, the south side of the building. Yes, the south side of the building. So we had, a, that was part of our development site, part of our FAR, and we, you know, we had a commercial base and we had a, a residential amenity and then at the first residential floor we were able to take our, like, our stair core in the building, this was a scissor stair building, we were able to cantilever the stair over to kind of open up the floor plan. Go one more slide here. You can see it on the side there, but it's over here, right? That's, this yeah. is looking north, that's yeah, the back of the building there. The stair is kind of in the, in the white zone that kind of goes out of the picture there. So that bathroom's actually in the cantilever portion over that neighbor, and there was a stair there. We didn't have the legal like distances on that side, so we only had it on the two street sides. So we put our core, we moved our core that way to kind of open up the floor plan. So in this case, we cantilevered, you know, and not for light and air, but just to kind of move the core over again back to efficiency. And here's a case where we actually, you know, we're looking at the floor plate size that was ideal for creating these like singular floor units. We put the structure just outside the floor area, the glass floor area. Another efficiency move. So now none of our living spaces have columns in them. And then from those column locations, we were further able to cantilever torch each street frontage to create these larger balconies, which were the extension of these homes. So these are kind of just ways of kind of creating more space for the, for the building without creating FAR. And, you know, in the, in the, in the effort to, create, again, create the most valuable, you know, some of the apartments in this case. That also started with an air parcel, by the way. Yes. And this is some of the, the blow-ups of it. And then Sylvian had 
Yeah. And the very famous yeah. 5600. Right here in Community Board 1? One? One, one, one of our best, I would say. Uh, designed by Herzog Damian and uh, looks very complicated, but it's not. Uh, it's a core with some uh, columns that they go straight and then a cantilever uh, portion that makes it very sculptural. Uh, the building itself, the floor plate, as you can see it, this that's a complicated floor plate, but it's again the core and the columns and uh, very successful was sold out when we reached the seventh floor. Uh, the developer told me, why don't you buy an apartment? But I said, I stick with the structural engineering at the moment. And they made a great mistake. But uh, that's so the first one. There's a couple of different kinds of cantilevering going on in this building. At the top, there's much more articulation than at the bottom half. Correct. What, what was the reason for that? Well, because uh, the top floor, you get most of the money. So you try to make them as special as possible. Uh, we have uh, all kinds of uh, recess small pools uh, for each apartment. Uh, that makes it very unique. Uh, all these penthouses and uh, um, the main point is that uh, you are questioning it's the cost work or not? And the answer is absolutely yes. These apartments they sold for 60, 70 million dollars a piece. So that's the one that well, I, I don't think they did too badly way. on the bottom half either. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is why not add a little bit of additional cement to extend the floor plate mm -hmm. and do something a little bit more articulated if the uh, return is so good? Because uh, we have many defects, but one of them is that we like heights. We like to see around what's going on. The higher you are, the better you feel, but the more money you are paying for. <laughs> so that's the reason. Uh, the guys at the bottom, they see only the a street across, so they pay less. I'm pretty sure I saw somebody collecting cans before they went into this uh, building. Yeah. I couldn't afford even the bottom one, but I wanted the top one in there. And then this is your... That's another project. Well, here are cantilever views aesthetically. It's a small building, but it's quite interesting. Next. Aesthetics. This one, uh, it has a small cantilever. It's about 18 or 20 feet. Uh, it's at the corner of uh, Third Avenue and 57th Street. Used to be a very nice movie house there that I used to go. Unfortunately, it's gone now, and I regret. But we have a new building. Is uh, the the cantilever? It's just to enlarge the living room to give a new dimension to the living room. Next one. Oh, that's very interesting. Uh, this building is the beautiful Pepsi Cola, what is called Pepsi Cola building. It's at the corner of 59th Street and Park Avenue. Uh, the building was designed by uh, four uh, Czech architects at the oh, time, uh, today yeah. called IMEA. And uh, uh, this picture doesn't give the right impression, but uh, at this side is the same volume like penetrates to the building and gets up over there. Now, the Pepsi Cola uh, a landmark building, the cantilever couldn't sit on the Pepsi Cola building. Uh, that's about 30 feet in length. I used to have a floor plan, I don't know, but it doesn't show. BS maybe. And uh, 
is going up about 40 floors. Uh, we frame it with columns, perimeter columns, and uh, straight floor, creating a tube. And at the bottom, we have some concrete walls that they, in reality, they uh, carry the weight only of a few floors. Once this perimeter tube got some muscle, the concrete got stronger, it carry the weight on its own. So there are no columns inside, only perimeter columns. It's a pity that we don't have the, uh, it sold out very fast. So we landmark, about 1985, I believe, or 89. Landmark sites make excellent sellers of development rights, right? Because they don't have anywhere to use them and they're gonna sell them at a low price. Uh, yeah. uh, the ability to cantilever over them is a fairly new, this is an early example, but you know, the Art Students League uh, case, uh, 217 uh, East 57th Street, uh, was another uh, you know, controversial and uh, you know, important uh, yeah. precedent here. Yeah. But the Landmarks Commission is starting to allow that to happen. Their determination is that it's appropriate to the contextual to the district to build something in the space above a landmark. And I think that's a, a great yeah, well, well, the, the volumes they integrate in a way with the existing landmark almost to perfection. It got numerous awards. And, uh, yeah, it's a nice example of it. Yeah. Next. Well, that's in Mexico. Uh, it's a sort of a bridging, and uh, it's nice. This is, this is the, uh, I think the next slide for you is the, uh, the, the bridging that I think is the most relevant in New York City, right? This is, right. everyone knows this building. Well, this building also, we got like two, three weeks ago. It got <coughs> from CTBOH in Chicago, got the, for some reason, the strange name, I don't know why, but they call it the tallest building in America that is not, but got the award for the tallest building in America. I don't know why they set up, I mean, they wanted to get some excitement. I, <laughs> but it's not the tallest, but it's you know, interesting. Best. No, I, point of fact, it's the best tall building oh. in North America. So they oh. do an annual award for every oh. continent. Oh. So it won North America. Honestly, even mm -hmm. that's one I question. <laughs> so it's okay. What is interesting for us, uh, both of them are rental, uh, designed by shop architects. Uh, one is thinking in this shape, the other one is leaning the other way. Yeah. Uh, well, well, it looks nice. Gene, speak but to the efficiency part here. The oh, efficiency no. is that they wanted an amenity, amenity floors. So we had the option of creating two amenity floors for each building or one amenity floor to sell all buildings, but in this case, people will have to travel up and down. I, I think what's interesting architecturally is that when you have larger sites, this is a very large, you know, full city block site, where you can kind of, you know, with a, to use the FAR and to kind of look it out, and we've looked at sites similar, you end up with two buildings, you know, if you have two buildings, there's a certain amount of inefficiency that's gonna go on than if you could have one building. Um, and the idea that they use this kind of connector as a way to kind of bridge the amenity between the building, I think, was a very, you know, very clever idea to kind of connect them. It's architectural, it's design, but it also kind of gives them a shared space that you wouldn't have to kind of duplicate each building. And people wouldn't have to kind of go from one tower to the other. And typically, you see this a lot on, on the base, you know, of a building yeah. where they'll share those amenities on a site this large. And we looked at sites in Jersey that are, like have large footprints and end up having these two towers and a shared base. But the value here is, you know, the amenities and everyone getting access to view. You know, that's kind of in, in this shared, this shared yeah. connector. And what you see, it's interesting, you see cantilevers on small sites, and these bridges you see right now on large sites, uh, right. the way to kind of get the efficiency. Well, I, we save money with this. Mm -hmm. We save money because we use only one amenity, FAR, mm -hmm. constructability. So by the end of the day, 
was a saving and unique feature. Yeah, right. Uh, swimming the looking pool. That's a, sw a swimming pool, right? Yeah. And a gym. And it's an infinity uh, pool. Yeah. I have to <coughs> thank you once. We go yeah. together in the water. <laughs> it will be uh, fun, lots of fun. Me <laughs> too. I know I've been there. You? Okay, <laughs> let's make a list. <laughs> oh, swimming. But all these sites that you see the bridging, they're always going to be a larger site where you have, you know, two kinds of building on one site. I mean, you know, so it's interesting. So and the cantilevers you see on all these sites. I should say from the piping, get the water in and out, mm -hmm. heating. I mean, it's a lot for a rental building in particular. Lots of savings and unique feature. All right, so all this is done on the same zoning lot, right? It's a yeah. block zoning lot. It's all in the same control. There's, what went on on the ground floor? Were they able to open up some of the ground floor to uh, open space, or is it just like retail and stuff? I, I think people here there's mostly open space on the ground floor, which okay. is great. It's an L shape that, that was purchased from Sheldon Solo. Right. That uh, he used to have the Con Edison. It's formerly Con Edison. Right, right. So, happened to be, this is an L shape, and the square, Filling up the L, it's a school, okay. beautiful school, yes, public school. Okay, so they're yeah. able to use the ground floor space for something else that's useful. You're right. Domino Sugar, another example, shop with the bridging. Oh yeah. Similar thing, but it's a big site. Yeah. You know, it's not you're not doing that over other buildings. No. The standard hotel goes over the high line, right? Uh, right. That's kind of like bridging, but it's uh, they put the whole building over the high line. Different animal. When are we going to do bridging over brownstones in Park Slope? Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Conceptually, you could, right? Conceptually, if you have a zoning lot here and a zoning lot here, and you get uh, you know, agreements with the neighbors in between, Got you it. can build two parts and bridge over it's the top. It's a very long story because it uh, depends. Uh, depends. And, uh, number one is who are the people downstairs? and the uh, community boards and all kinds of other... This is all as of right, so... Yeah. Yeah. But uh, definitely. And the question will be, uh, was, what are the benefits? Uh, that's the big question. Is the, that, is the floor enough of a benefit to justify that sort of expense? Yeah, but like here we don't have buildings on below. Right. Uh, the amenity, it's just that it's one rather than two. Right. If we can find the reasoning of a bridging over the other buildings to save something or to make it more economical and to give the public some enjoyment, yes. Okay. I think you, I think it's you know as there's smaller sites and looking for clever ways to use the area and zoning allows and you can do it as of right. I think it's going to be experimented with next time around. It's a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. Well, yeah, it takes one person doing it. It needs a couple more yeah, bridging but concepts. But yeah, this one, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's also called the Atlantis, and uh, it's in Dubai. Don't worry, it's uh, not here. Mm -hmm. And then this one. Let's go back. Can we go back? Mm -hmm. uh, it's about two million square foot, designed by KPF. Uh, looks interesting. Lots of engineering challenges. We work like crazy. We didn't make a penny, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so bridging again, bridging big sites. All the bridging. Let's go back. <laughs> all the bridging are steel trusses that they go from one side to another. All of them are still trusses. By the way, the one on the American copper, the amenity one, are also still trusses. And the challenges here, as well as on the American copper engineering challenges, is that the buildings, they move in different directions and you have a bridge that has to float in between the two buildings and take in account the maximum movement in the wind and not to fall down. Same thing happened here, so that's what our money wants. <laughs>
That's a matter like that. That's not yet built. It started, and uh, it's a uh, uh, this Japanese architect, Dato, Dato. I think the last image we brought up was a project that we're also doing together. So this is our project here in uh, downtown. On 45 Broad Street. It is a project which we actually started with a cantilever in the building. At this point in the building here, um, and it was, you know, there's a T shaped plan. The building originally had the T shaped inverse on each other, and there was this transition of a windbreak. This is our, it's a super tall tower that we're doing with Sylvia's office. Uh, it's 1,100 feet tall. Uh, the openings are architectural windbreaks in the building. So the building has since been simplified. You know, the DE process, again, constructability and cost coming into play. You know, early on, we looked at some of the costing of that. So the cantilevered portion that was, you know, happening, we've kind of simplified the project and straightened it out. But the interesting thing was these windbreaks, which kind of reduced the amount of resistance that the surface areas create, were really kind of great opportunities. You know, needed architecturally, needed structurally, but then became possibilities of really kind of creating a, a space in the building that's a, you know, unique to the city in this particular building in, in itself. So uh, these spaces that you have to have for structural reasons, from an architectural point of view, we try to capture them and we, use them as a part of the all your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Back and forth, we get that. So you can see from uh, some of the examples here today that uh, really the sky's the limit uh, in terms of using airspace <laughs> above your property, above your uh, neighbor's properties. Uh, there's legal frameworks to deal with these things. The Department of Buildings knows how to analyze them. Talented professionals know how to present the materials to the Department of Buildings for approval. And developers will figure out the pros and cons, count the money, and make sure that it makes sense. Um, so. This is really something that we're going to see a lot more of, and uh, this is a good uh, cap of where we've been since uh, 1987. Well, we have a few minutes for questions. Right. Uh, could you comment a little bit on how they calculate, like, for instance, I know for one Madison, there was the mass stick that were put up in the top of the building to help uh, minimize the swaying. So as it relates to just general construction of super tall buildings or tall buildings and cantilevers and doing the analysis and the mass dampener, how that may uh, you know, change the mathematics or the calculations and the, the concept of how high to go and, and how that relates to the overall design. Well, th th there is no real correlation between the cantilever and the uh, acceleration and the damper. Uh, very little, almost none. Uh, the, the acceleration is a function of the uh, stiffness of the building and the mass of the building, the heavier it is. So in a way you can say by adding cantilever we are adding more mass to well, the building. It, but by the fact that you are adding the cantilever, you are lowering the building and that one on its own decreases the acceleration. So indirectly you can say that yes, there is a help. Uh, Say that because you mentioned a word that we like so much, the tune mass damper, that uh, you do it in order to decrease the acceleration and the perception of the building. And there was a time when that was a no no. Can, can, you, uh, can you back up for a minute? When we're talking about the acceleration, we're talking about the building sway. So when you're in your apartment relaxing on a Friday night, you don't get sick to your stomach when there's a windstorm. Correct. But what is it that you're doing with, what is the dampener and what is it doing to prevent that? Well, thank you for asking that question because <laughs> I know we were looking for something that somebody was this question. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is the acceleration is the change of velocity. If the velocity is constant, you feel nothing. When you push the gas on the car, you are changing the velocity. Or you push the brake. If you travel the same speed, 90 miles an hour, you feel nothing. But if you go from 45 to zero, you feel a lot. So that's the acceleration. Now, all the buildings, they have acceleration. All the building by the sense of the movement, you have this change of velocity. However, 
they made research with hundreds of people, various ages, with different positions. If you stand up, if you lay down, if you, I cannot describe all the positions because I don't want to become erotic, but <laughs> they made a lot of studies to check the when people are feeling the movement and when they are not. And they established based on that criteria and numbers for residential, for offices, for hotels. Okay. And what is interesting, the codes, they do not address this issue. The codes, like New York City or any other codes, they address only the issue of uh, uh, safety, that the building will not fall down. How much is going to move or what the people are going to feel, that's a luxury item. It's nothing related to the safety of the building. So the building, the code doesn't care about that. Now, one more minute. This issue of how we do it, we place some heavier weights or water or all kinds of uh, viscoelastic like shock absorbent in a car that in a sense they don't they go with the building like big masses that are hung over there they go with the building but they do not go with the same acceleration as the building goes they go a little slower and this little slower is like pulling back the building and making it not to feel it. Got it. Now, we started years ago, and one of them was 845, what is called 845 First Avenue, mm -hmm. the Trump uh, UN mm -hmm. president. So, that time when we told them, Mr. Trump, we need tune mass damper, said, no way. Nobody is going to buy an apartment knowing that we have these massive weights at the top of it. Everybody will say, oh, is something wrong with the building. Said, yeah, sorry, but we need it. So we had to get another third party engineer to check on us and to reinforce our position that we need the TMD, the tune mass damper. By the end, we installed the tune mass damper but the next buildings he gave to somebody else, not to us. Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe. We finished 432 Park Avenue with two weights, 650 tons each. Water, right? No, they are not water. They filled up with concrete. That they are hanged with ropes and some other stuff at the bottom. And uh, we never talked about it because we learned the lesson of the president. Don't talk about this. Nobody will learn about it. So I to Brian's question. One more, one more second. <laughs> I don't know, the, other day, the other day, the developer is telling me, Sylvia, believe it or not, I took 20 people up there. I said, why, Harry? said, because they like it so much, so they bought apartments. Yeah, see? <laughs> so now it's becoming a selling tool. Right. The one that the president said, no way, and he didn't give me any other job for that. <laughs> Today is something that people are very Let's proud of. Let's not start They're talking about efficient. errors of judgment <laughs> by that developer. <laughs> but to it's Brian's right. question, the bulk of the building and the cantilever don't figure any differently in the acceleration and the need for a dampener in that analysis. Only with respect to the fact that by having the cantilevers, the building is not as tall as without the cantilever. Right. right. So in effect, now, it does. that is a nice segue into what we've alluded to in the past, but maybe we can extrapolate upon a little bit more of these magic numbers. Now, you know, when you're building uh, block and plan construction, which I do more than I'd like to do it, but you know, it's like 13 or 14 stories, sometimes you have concrete base. Mm -hmm. Anything about that, you've got to switch to poured concrete or something stronger, right? Um, that's a magic number. 
What are some of the magic numbers that go into cantilevers, into the need to provide a dampener, into these things that add costs that maybe we want to use when we're going up in height, uh, a cantilever to you know go uh, out in, in width instead of up? Well, yeah, well, there, are, there are a few different numbers that come into play. I mean, at that point when you need a dampener or not has come into play. We've had projects where at a certain height we need the dampening and at a, a certain height reduction we do not. That is a huge factor that that dampening system could be in the millions of dollars. 10 million, 20 million. It's something we went through on our Nomad site. Yeah. And it, that balancing between the height of the building, the need for a damper, or pulling it down, more cantilevers, and that, that's part of the interplay we give or take. So that's a huge factor in determining what you want to do with the area and that height. And then the other one is, is that a height limit though? Is that a number of stories? Is that a mass of square footage? Little, little. Yeah, it's, it's what we call it the slender mm -hmm. slice pattern. Ah, yes. I know it well. <laughs> Don't lose weight. <laughs> Before, you know, my head. <laughs> when I was in college, we heard a skinny guy, and we were laughing. That we said, this, we have to put stones on his pockets for a windy day, so he will not fly. Exactly. Right. Is that an engineering job? Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Applicable. So we have a height that kind of happens when you. you, you there's a 600 foot height limit where the MEP systems introduces another kind of uh, tank and pump system that is, you know, there's a cost to it. It's not a huge cost, but if you're right around that number, you'd rather, you'd rather be under 600 than over 600. As a seller of the right to cantilever over my building, yeah. uh, how much can I charge, <laughs> depending on how, on how do I know where you're too slender or not slender enough? Where is the, where is the sweet spot? Well, on the structural engineer. Select the good structural engineer. <laughs> That's the number one issue. Now, number two will follow. Bob Shapiro, you're, yeah. you're hearing my line of questioning here. What do you want to share your thoughts? On a double cantilever, you have a problem with the wind shear factor. Not necessarily, not necessarily. Depends on the overall shape of the building. Uh, Usually, uh, if you cut the corners, then the vortex that creates the shearing factor is minimized. If not, we try to work with the architects to shape the building in such a way to reduce the wind. We also use all kinds of uh, gimmicks like in 432 and other buildings creating the open floors. You, the building is a safe, okay? The bolt with the sail. If you poke holes into the sail, the bolt doesn't move. The same thing is with the building. 432, we have five floors that are open floors. The wind can go through. No vortex. We minimize the acceleration by about 15 to 20 percent, thanks to the fact that we have open floors. But we have also other methodologies in order to counter the acceleration. We have time for one more question. Uh, I have one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so we were just having this discussion today at the museum uh, about a project, and maybe Sylvia, you're the engineer for it. Um, it's a shop project uh, on Cherry, Cherry Street. So yes. are you? Oh, we love Joe. An interesting, um, what we were trying to figure out the slenderness of the building uh, and, and how it fit into the typology that I showed at the very beginning, because mm -hmm. that building has a 25 or 30 percent affordable units. In right. it. So my question um, is, in, in general, separate from the weeds of that particular building, is it possible to do these kinds of projects where the mathematics actually works by including affordable units? Or do they all need to be above, you know, above middle, right? luxury units? You know, 
Is, is it a possibility to go down market on this building type, or is it just impossible? No, why not? Everything is possible. There's nice uh, balances with 421A and inclusionary rights. Uh, all of which I know Excel is using on the site next door. So um, yeah, but that's that that's different than whether you get a subsidy for against taxes in selling off a unit you're producing is different than if you're get, if you're getting uh, if you, if you're obliged to provide a, a large percentage of small units that are going to change the equation of. The number of elevators that you need, well, the it, rent it, that that has to be cross subsidized by the market also, rate. Th there's also two types of affordable, right? There's on site affordable housing and then there's off site bonuses that you yeah. can buy. So in the case where you buy the off site bonuses in a in a contextual district that limits how tall you can do a building, you absolutely are using these cantilevers to aid in the floor to floor height to get the yeah. extra two FAR onto your site. Yeah. You you almost can't get there and get to a you know, a market rate project where the floor flow heights are, you know, as desirable as you'd like them to be without, you know, trying these techniques. In a project where the affordable is on site, it would again come down to, is it make the building more cost effective to keep it lower by using the cantilever if there's an extreme. If you do a 10 for cantilever, you're almost not even changing the structural cost, uh, cost of the project, especially if you're in a reinforced concrete scenario. If you're in a block and plank scenario in 13 stories, okay. a cantilever could. But that is my question. In in that situation where it's on site and you have to cross subsidize to, to the market rate units, do you have to go with the cheaper solution, a lower rise project, right, rather than a, than a slender well, this always, strategy? Always we go the, we don't go the cheaper, but more efficient solution. Yeah. But uh, on the cherry one, it's a good example, we didn't talk here, but it's a bridging over an existing building. Oh. Uh, We've already done it. With one column, for some reason, wasn't included. But uh, um, with one column, but building sitting on one column at the corner, it's a very unique project, really. But uh, we we just restarted the job this week, so. Uh, the question so then. Carol, you forgot the main thing: the efficiency. The one that you repeat always, how you increase the, how you gain 300 square foot. The switchback scissors there. But that's it. Yes, I know. He talked about that. You yeah. didn't yeah. say. Yeah. No, I said it earlier. Oh, you, you were then it? in the program. Okay. <laughs> so for the one that never didn't hear it, it's Carol's story. That, uh, I would call her a co-inventor already. It's the double loops there. But you need floor height, a minimum of 15 foot 6 floor to floor. Now, it's more expensive to build 15 foot 6 tall floors. However, the 300 square foot that you are gaining on a high-end residential, that makes a lot of sense. So that's one of the issues that we have used, uh, the double loop, 15 foot 6 minimum. And uh, we made it uh, uh, more efficient. And so we end the conversation on another magic number, 15 foot 6. <laughs> That's correct. Right. Thank you very much to our esteemed panel. Thank you for the time. Museum. How many people is it your first time here tonight? Okay, well, welcome. So now you now you discovered us. Come back. Uh, in fact, this evening is um, well. Let me just say, as I've asked the fans around here, they have to go you know, go back. That we just opened um, our new exhibition, Skyline. Uh, okay, I'll keep one of them. Uh, and uh, you know, please look around after. We will have reception after the panel, as long as they don't talk too long. But there's reception, uh, wine, and water over there. So uh, we'll uh, have about 45 minutes or so of presentations and discussion. Uh, usually, the museum uh, runs a, a monthly series of book talks. And we also have a series that we call Skyscraper Seminars. And this really falls into that category. It was um, the idea, I think, of John Citra to put this group together for this evening. 
Uh, and unfortunately, he couldn't be with us because he's taking his daughter up to Albany, I just learned, in order to take her law exams, which is a, a pretty good excuse uh, for <laughs> not coming, uh, not showing up for the evening. But I did serve on um, a, a program at the Museum of City in New York with John just last fall or so, which was similar to this. It was about the super slender towers, but it was in a fairly uh, but a somewhat hostile environment with a lot of community uh, people and advocates and um, for uh, low rise up on the especially on the Upper East Side. Uh, but I think it was an important evening um, of presenting, much like we have tonight, various perspectives by architects, by politicians, um, by uh, land use lawyer that describes the characteristics, and here they are, because I want to promote the museum's website and our past uh, projects a little bit. So this is on our website, and it came out of an exhibition uh, for which I interviewed uh, John Citra and, and Nancy, uh, and also Sylvia and Marcus, and this was a show that we did called Sky High and the Logic of Luxury, which back in 2013, uh, when we put the show up, had only one tower, 157, um, that's still edge of the that was, uh, was under construction that, was, that seemed to represent the new type of super slender tower. But as you can see in this chronological lineup of the history of those projects, and there's some of the ones that we'll talk about tonight, one Madison, for example, is the second in a series of buildings that uh, take slenderness as a strategy of development. And tonight we want to look at the development side, at the architecture and engineering part of the equation, um, and also at land use and the possibility of uh, creativity and invention within, within land use, uh, which is so well exemplified in this new typology of towers uh, that um, I call super slenders, but are, are ultra luxury towers in almost uh, every case. They use this slenderness strategy of putting eyeballs as high as you possibly can in the sky and using the very limited FAR, the floor area ratio, um, by piling it onto a single point and thereby creating all these engineering problems that need to be solved. But it, this is an invention within the communities of development, design, architectural design, engineering, and, and also land use. And we have presenters uh, to discuss that, especially in, in conversation tonight, but there are some slides after, now after mine um, that are going to uh, describe, kind of pick, pick apart, un unpack, as it were, the various aspects of, of um, several projects and uh, give a kind of predicate for the, uh, the, the legal um, constraints that, ex that exist in New York. So the moderator for um, this, this evening is Paul uh, Pruel. Am I pronouncing your, your name correctly? Pruel. Pruel, Pruel, sorry. Because uh, there's an X at the, at, at the end. Uh, who is a land use lawyer at Carter, Ledger, and Milburn. Uh, he has practiced extensively uh, before lots of uh, uh, land use agencies and then the city council. Uh, and he, but he's also a trained urban planner and holds a graduate degree from Pratt, um, Institute, uh, Pratt Institute School of Architecture. And then uh, a, a partner of John Citra's at Citra Ruddy is uh, G Eugene Flotteron. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, who is the principal and director of architecture there at the firm, um, and a, a, a firm that practices globally, but we're going to look at in particular the, these New York projects. Uh, he uh, is also trained at Pratt, so we have lots of, uh, of representation there. Uh, and. Um, and uh, you know has uh, awards and, and memberships in a lot of professional organizations. And then John Pierce, um, our uh, developer representative for this evening, is the senior vice president of design and construction at the Rockefeller Group. He has a lot of background uh, that in construction and project management, uh, both in the U.S. and um, also in you know, some, spent some time in Latin America. And uh, so he's going to bring that the kind of developer's perspective to the group. And then Sylvia Marcus, um, who has uh, graced the stage of the Skyscraper Museum many times, and we've been on panels to, uh, to together you. before. Thanks uh, for you. Uh, 
and most of the people who are in those big council on tall buildings and urban habitat audiences are there to see Sylvian because, as it says right here in your bio, you're a world-renowned engineer. And most of, at least half of the buildings, I think, on, on this list, um, Sylvian uh, has been the structural engineer for. So uh, as I build up a little body heat in the room, um, uh, I think I should, I should turn it over to Paul at this point to, to set up the evening.